definition of Democrat, folks who are unqualified to do the job they were hired to do. It's not tolerated in the private sector, so why is it tolerated in government? It would be funny if it weren't so damaging and pathetic. Speaking of funny, my buddy Rob Carson joins us for a belly laugh. And if you think about it, that's how you get your weekend off to a great start with The Chris Alcedo Show on TNT Radio. Google and Facebook, they don't sell you anything. They sell you. Facebook constantly manipulates their users. They do it by the things that they insert into the news feeds. And they do it by the types of hosts they allow their users to see. It's what Google and Facebook are doing on a regular basis by suppressing stories, by steering us towards other stories rather than the stories we're actually seeking. That's the real manipulation that's going on. I was a design ethicist at Google where I studied how do you ethically steer people's thoughts. It will always favor one online music service over another and one candidate over another. Google and Facebook has the power to undermine democracy without us knowing that democracy has been undermined. There's what I call the creepy line and the the Google policy about a lot of these things is to get right up to the creepy line but not cross it. Google crosses the creepy line every day. Discover how society is manipulated by Google and Facebook. The creepy line at SalemNow.com. News to start your day. Good morning. How about some news? Just tell your smart device to wake up. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Now, my first guest this hour is Joanne Nova. Joanne won uh, prizes as a science grad and international awards as a blogger. She's author of the Skeptics Handbook, which has been translated into 15 languages. Each day, 5,000 people read joannenova.com.au. In 2018, Jo toured Europe speaking about how to destroy an electric grid. Before blogging, she hosted a children's TV series on Channel 9, was a regular keynote speaker and managed the Shell Questacon Science Circus. She was an associate lecturer in science communication at ANU. Jo Nova, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, Jo. You got me? Yeah, I do. I good, do. Sorry. Got good to have you show. Now, I see. Well. I like to see someone has uh, had some interaction with the television. You're a presenter on television. Do you think there's any chance that Channel Nine would like to have you back some stage to give a you know a, a fairer appraisal on the the climate catastrophe that faces us? Oh, I'm far too far too risky now. Most of the channels in Australia are very politically correct. Yes, indeed, indeed. You've been doing Apart this for quite a while. So we do at least have one, but, yeah, ev- everything else is very politically correct. Do you get a go on Sky at times or? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yep. So, no, no, yep. they're, they're good people, and uh, but, but it's a wasteland amongst free-to-air TV here. So you've been doing this for quite a while because I was looking at your blog years, many years ago. Have you noticed any change over the, the, the period that you've been um, calling out this uh, uh, climate uh, cabal? Uh, very much. And so when I started, it was very risky to say, oh, maybe climate change is not the thing. And uh, it was, but it was very much, it was more of a science debate then, even though name calling was rampant and bullying and whatnot. The other side felt obliged to answer sometimes. And so, you know, when we would put out criticisms, they would come back with a response. By about 2014, 2015, they, I think, had realised that there was um, there was no gain for them in trying to do that because they kept losing. Um, and so they just started to ignore us. And that around that time, Google and other search engines started to downrank us, to pull us from the search results. Because, you know, it was such a fun fight on the internet back in the early days when you could literally outrank all sites, even big sites, uh, just by putting out a funny kind of side of the truth, which would score links from everywhere. And so we were winning and in internet polls and internet voting and things like that. And so, yeah, I guess they gave up even trying to fight fair. And uh, now we have this internet, which is gradually getting more and more censored uh, and artificially curated 
And, uh, you know, obviously people can still read us. And by the way, I, mu- I must fix the stats on my blog because um, when you said 5,000 readers a day, I checked recently only because I got the, the, the Dauntless Climate Purveyor Award from CFACT and Heartland and uh, discovered that it's now like ten to 15,000 people a day wow. reading okay. the site. So that's fantastic. The word is still getting out. Uh, and there are more sceptics than ever in the world, but it is uh, it is really difficult to crack that bubble to reach people on the other side. So it's interesting, is it, because there's a narrative and they need to control it and they're struggling, as you say, to control the narrative and the truth is sort of seeping out all around them, but somehow it keeps going on and we'll, talk, we'll get to the IPCC report in a minute. But Because I, I Googled you and you talk about the uh, uh, internet being the place that, uh, that, that where they really control the narrative as much as they can now. And your Wikipedia page says, you're, you know, you're noted as a prominent climate change denier. Well, and that's such an honour to be known. <laughs> it's just, you know, climate change and I, it's a science debate. Everyone should be able to see it is just a form of name calling. They want to uh, win the debate before people even ask the question. So one way of doing that is just to call everyone who disagrees with them kindergarten names like climate denier, you've got the brain of a lizard, you can't even think. Um, And so they kind of win by default. And once we point out the name calling, you know, straight away I think everybody can see that it's not about a science debate. If they had overwhelming evidence, they would be able to debate us fairly, call us our proper names and just say, look, you're wrong because we've got this, this and this. But they tried that and they failed. And, you know, I believe quite a lot of them sincerely thought they had the science and the evidence, and some of them still do. But, you know, when there's a fair debate, we we were just killing them. And so clearly they couldn't keep doing that. So is that the problem now? We're just facing their hubris. They can't come back down off that hill because they did believe in what they were pushing maybe a decade ago or whatever, but now they're stuck with that proposition? Or is it something oh, more sinister than that, that? That is definitely true for some, but let, let's get real. It's not hubris. It's giant amounts of money being thrown in mm. one direction. It's whole careers, which were, you know, as far as I can tell, mostly B-grade scientists who are not the Ivy Leaguers. They were not the top-notch people in physics and maths. Uh, and, the, you know, they're people who loved surfing and got into oceanography or something like that and end up being a star with climate junkets. You know, the UN climate junkets are two weeks a year and they get flown around the world. They get treated like a hero saving the earth. They know on some level, maybe subconsciously, that they would never be able to make it in the world of science if they were in another field of science where there was actual competition where people were paid to point out the holes and the ridiculous arguments they're putting forward. So, in a sense, they're defending a lifestyle, they're defending their identity, their whole belief in themselves. You know, I'm talking about the scientists here because behind the scenes are the people who throw the money at it. And, I, you know, it, <laughs> I think it's, there's some pretty dark... We, you know, once we start talking about BlackRock and others who are twisting the whole debate behind the scenes, I don't think that's got anything to do with hubris. It is just pure uh, power, control, money. And, well, Larry and Fink which, is the CEO of BlackRock. He has more money well, than most yeah. states. Sorry, you were going to say, yeah, speaking of well, which. Oh, well, and he does and he doesn't. This is a really important point. BlackRock controlled at one point as many as, as well, 10 trillion in assets, which, yes, as you were saying, makes them, uh, it is like the third biggest country in the world in terms of financial kind of power. But that's not BlackRock's money. That is pension funds, other people's money, investors, people asleep at the wheel who don't even know their money is being used against them, who haven't asked the hard question, you know, is BlackRock controlling my retirement funds? Am I funding Larry Fink to wander around the world threatening people with nice business you have there and we'll do something about it if you don't bring on a carbon target or promise to do this or at least make a media release about it? And so we given, uh, by default, sleep at the wheel, people have given Larry Fink that power. Now, they can take that back, and people need to know that. And so they need to start saying, well, hang on a minute. You know, I don't want my funds used for that kind of thing. I need to pull them out. And this is what I think something like 20 U.S. states, maybe as many as 25, have now started writing to BlackRock and others and saying, well, hang on, we don't want our pension funds, our state-forced pension funds to be used against the people of the state who vote for cheap electricity 
but then Larry Fink uses their money to go along and threaten people and cancel cheap electricity and vow that we won't, you know, this bank won't invest in fossil fuels or all this other kind of nonsense. So it's profoundly anti-democratic, and thank goodness the U.S. states are there with the power to do that. And I and Ron DeSantis in Florida are stepping up and saying, "Well, that's it. We're pulling some of our funds. It's only two billion, so a tiny percentage of the total BlackRock funds, but." It sent a ripple through the world where, you know, BlackRock and others can see what's coming and they have started to pull back and their language has shifted and they are now talking about fiduciary duty, the idea that they're actually supposed to make money for people's pension funds rather than change the world and make us all nice people and decide what energy we should use and all that kind of stuff. How so does, I do think there. Well, how does a minnow like Australia begin to fight back, like you say, so the US is capable of fighting back, maybe some of the bigger markets, like obviously the Chinese don't seem to be too constricted by climate concerns anyway, they're continuing to invest in coal as India continue to invest in coal. Uh, how does a minnow like Australia, which relies on foreign investment, we rely on those foreign banks, the sort of banks that Larry Fink is talking about, how do we begin to push back against this narrative? Well, and it's really difficult because if you look at what uh, Frydenberg and Scott Morrison did around the time of the Glasgow Agreement, so it was November 2020, I think, they went to that uh, event saying, oh, yes, we will do net zero. And the reason they gave for it was because the bank said they would raise our interest rates by 1.5% if we didn't do net zero. Now, the voters didn't vote for it. Every time the voters have had the choice in Australia, they have voted clearly against it in a landslide. You're thinking back to Tony Abbott, the only guy in the last sort of 25 years to say, actually, we really don't want carbon uh, emissions trading schemes and carbon credits, acts of carbon tax, and he won 90 seats. So... It, it is clear the voters never wanted it. So what they've done is snuck it in with Malcolm Turnbull deceptively putting in the safeguard mechanism, which I think even quite a few of the senators didn't realise what they were signing in when they signed it in. So we got an emissions trading scheme by default and uh, through secrecy and then the Liberals couldn't brag about it because they were essentially telling the public if they bragged about it that they were, had achieved exactly what the public didn't vote them to do. And then Scott Morrison and Frydenberg come out with this, you know, Australia has a net zero thing and they didn't do it for the voters. They did it because the bankers were threatening them. So, Do you think, I thought you know. in 2019, Morrison came out really hard in the election that he looked like he had no chance of winning or Labor by how yep. much, and then he won, but he came out hard against Labor's really uh, um, hard-edged climate change policies against uh, well, shortened I opposition. Well, hard, but he, he did draw a defining line and he did point he did. out the excesses and the expenses of going to net zero and so he had some strength to his case, he had some backbone, and the voters voted for him. He came and into the parliament when, holding a chunk of coal. Well, that was, I think, before he even became yeah. um, prime minister. Um, yes, he had some policies then that differentiated himself and that the public liked. Talking about the cost of electricity is a win because people don't want to pay more for net zero whenever we survey them. Everybody says, yeah, we want to solve climate change. No, I don't want to put more than a dollar a month in. And you know, as soon as you ask the right questions, you find out what people really think, which is none but of Joe, them. Joe, my theory is, and change. I just see what you think of this, I think my theory that Morrison sort of held some sort of ground in 2019 and clearly, clearly won the election on that policy, then absolutely yep. capitulated. So he signed us up to every agreement you could imagine by the end of that term. But that's because Donald Trump was there. Do you think Donald Trump provided some sort of moral support to him where he thought there was a big player that can actually make a difference? Trump had pulled uh, the US out of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, no, you're absolutely on the money there. And, and I think this is a sad thing, and I tell my US friends, that your elections, I say to them, matter more than ours. If Trump was still in, we wouldn't have a net zero policy. We wouldn't have carbon trading being ramped up quietly and... It, all of this would be different. And so, yes, they had to get rid of Trump um, every which way. And unfortunately, it does. It matters to us a lot. That's even more frightening in a way. I'm going to go to a break and I'll come back and talk to you about that. You're listening to TNT Radio. Come on. Here's what's making news. TNT Radio News. Matt Boyland here with a look at your TNT headlines. 
The European Union has been accused of sacrificing the needs of its own people after approving a $2 billion plan to resupply Ukraine with ammunition. Russia has warned the world will face oil supply shortages within the next few years due to a lack of investment in the industry. And shop fronts were smashed up and set ablaze in Paris on Thursday night as anger at the French president exploded into civil unrest. Did you know there are many ways you can listen to TNT Radio? Why not stream us direct from our website on your desktop, tablet or mobile device? Or download our app from the App Store. We even stream live on YouTube, Rumble and Odyssey. We've got you covered on TNT Radio. If they, Joe, if they stop Trump from because he was getting in the way of the climate narrative then the fact that they can stop Trump is more frightening than the climate narrative itself, isn't it? Uh, Yes, yes. I think the most important thing at the moment is that I hope and pray that someone and people in the US can manage to get fair elections so that the voters can pick. I feel confident that if people get to... Uh, you, know, we, you know, if we get to the point of paper ballots and voter ID, I'm pretty confident the world would pull back from the brink. But um, Without a virus you know, those... to worry about, maybe we will. <laughs> well, I don't, I, yeah, I don't have that much confidence, actually. Although, you know, I talk to people in the US and, and they certainly have fixed some things up. And the Republicans, even though they're still a mixed bag, I mean, we know that some of the Republicans are not serving the Republican ideal in any sense. So, you know, the uni party lives and breathes and yeah, people have to learn to not vote for the majors, I think. Um, the rhinos hated there, Trump. There is, his own side hated him. Yes. Well, some of his own side did. They worked against him all the way. And, it, it, yes, it, it, there is a growing awareness, though. So many more people are sceptical. And that comes back to a poll that came out last week, which I want to share, which is the one, and I can't say his name properly, but Vivek Ramaswathi, uh, um, I just botched, botched it, it, came out with saying, Climate change is just a religion done for power and control. It's got nothing to do with the climate. And uh, and he's another candidate for president, uh, by the way, in the US. And that uh, we've been saying that for years in sceptical blogs. But it captured something, and Rasmussen, the uh, polling group, decided they would quiz people. So they surveyed 1,000 people, roughly, and came up with an astonishing, astounding, amazing 60% of people agreed with the sentence and 47% agreed strongly. So we got the astounding point where nearly half of US voters agree that climate change is a religion done for power and control that has nothing to do with the climate. So I think we've got to keep repeating that. We've got to keep saying that. It's a meme with power. It undoes a lot of the fossil fuel funding debate. And, you know, for years they've been tarring us, saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter what you guys say, it doesn't matter what evidence you have, you're all funded by fossil fuels, So, it, which was a lie, but it was very effective in that. And I've had debates with guys on my site, guys who've read my site for years, and I've let them comment, and, you know, you'd think there would be a tiny bit of goodwill there. And after five years of this, they, I will come out with a killer point about 28 million radio songs or something, and their answer is, yeah, but you get money from fossil fuels. And there's no no evidence because I haven't, and so it just it it keeps that belief living. But if we undermine that by saying climate change is a religion done for power and control, it opens doors for people to go. You know, maybe they're right. Maybe we should listen to the other side of the story, and then you can start talking science because you've got minds that are open to discussing the evidence. But if it's a if it's a religion, as you so aptly describe it as, then that's really again more cause cause for concern, isn't it? Because it's not like oh something I thought, but uh, I was wrong. Okay, sorry, Joe, you were right. I was wrong. That's a bit embarrassing. That's awkward. But you know, I've admitted now. I can get on with it. But that's not possible, is it? Well, There's it just is in an a way, intractable. It, 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 no, I haven't given up at all because the thing about a religion is in this case, it's a religion of people who don't believe it's a religion. It's a people believing in it because they think it's the science. But by saying that, we are undermining the very core of their kind of belief in themselves. And it, it, it's a great way to get people to kind of, it slows them, it stops them in their tracks. And of course, as I've said before, I think that the way to do that also is to point out who really wants the climate change legislation who's pushing it who's lobbying for it the bankers do the bankers care about the climate do you believe that because even the diehard greens and i used to be a green so i understand where they're coming from even the diehard greens do not believe 
that bankers are doing things to be nice people. So uh, how, can you just tell me about that? How did you transition from being green supporting Joe Nova to now being the Joe Nova I'm clearly talking to today? Well, you know, we all grow up sometimes. Well, actually, we don't. Yes. Some people don't. Yeah. But um, it was one Peter issue Peter Garrett at a time. comes to mind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It, it was one issue at a time. And I would hear arguments from um, sceptics and, and only – in it, yeah. <laughs> Mostly the sceptics kept quiet because they were called deniers and they just didn't say anything. And that's the problem. If I had come across real sceptics younger and sooner, a switch would have been quicker and sooner for me. But people didn't say things. I didn't meet real sceptics. I actually ended up marrying one. Um, and he wasn't a sceptic when I married him. He gradually became one. And then he said to me, where's the evidence? And I said, well, of course there's evidence. And then I had to find the damn evidence, didn't I? And I went looking and I could not believe how many sceptics were out there on the internet and how they were so polite and how they kept arguing with, su with such good reason. And I was like, wow, I've never come across these arguments. Where have they been hiding? Why didn't I know this? Why didn't New Scientist, a, a magazine that I paid for for years and thought was giving me, you know, the science. Um, and it was so eye-opening. And I realized literally in one afternoon in like a few hours that there was a whole world of information out there I had no idea of. That was on the climate change debate. But in terms of the green philosophy, there are so many issues, things like the way, you know, they were feminists telling us how females were always you know at the on the the bad side of every equation and i was kind of going well not really you know guys are younger than women guys are jailed more than women guys are the ones fighting in the you know army they get to give their lives to the country doesn't that isn't that kind of unfair and who's speaking for them and you know so it was one issue at a time for me and on every single issue on its arguments and faults i would take the arguments from one side back to green's friends and they had nothing and they had no response. And so one issue at a time, and for me, climate change wasn't until 2007. It was quite late. But, yeah, it was like a few hours on the internet going, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that there are so many good reasons to doubt this, and I'd never heard any of them. All these victim narratives you talk about, they sort of coalesce, don't they? They're all part of the same story. Well, very much we're seeing that now, and, I'm, it, it, you know, it's having a terrible effect on the, uh, you know, younger generation, the the poor um, Z gens, you know, race to believe that being a victim is their defining identity. And, you know, it's horrible what we see there in terms of just this is how I score attention, this is how I prove I'm worthwhile, this is, you know, give me some label, give me some, you know, some victim something. And, you know, it, we've got to defeat that and that's it's crushing. And how do you find your way through it? How do you stay strong for the fight, Joe? Um, you know, it, it's difficult. You've got to be a bit of an optimist. You've got to look back at things that happened that were terrible in the past and go, well, this is, it looks terrible, but it isn't as bad as then. And, you know, back in the yeah. 60s, people must have looked at the assassination of JFK and the nuclear bombs waiting to go off and the, the all the corruption that was running then. And they must have thought that, you know, it was the end of the world, but we managed to pull back. So I'm, I'm still hopeful we can, but it is scary. And I think a lot of people need to be empowered just to point out the bullying because bullying is controlling so much of our society. So many people are afraid to speak, afraid to say anything like, you know, you look at what they did to JK yeah. Rowling. So yeah. we need to empower people by just saying the word bullying and name calling. And it's that basic. And if we change the debate, we go meta. We stop trying to win a science debate with scientific facts. And I say that hesitantly because ultimately science is only ever decided on data and facts. So I don't want people to think that the science debate is anything other than facts and evidence and that's what it should be but we have to pull back and fight meta we have to start changing the whole debate and stop saying well you know this fact is wrong and this thing is wrong we have to actually talk about name calling and bullying and point out their motivations why is it that they keep saying well we care about co2 and co2 is going to destroy the planet and then every choice they make doesn't reduce CO2, you know? If Except they really when we're going to Davos, to... having another meeting here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> well, of course. Yeah. I mean, if they wanted to reduce CO2, if CO2 mattered, we would all be going nuclear. Yeah. And clearly we're they'd not. Stop... So, and if they're worried about climate, if they're worried about the seas rising, they'd stop <laughs> buying homes. Oh. 
on you the think coast. they would stop buying homes on the beach? Yes, you would, wouldn't you? And and so it's those kind of things we need to point out because what we need is a circuit breaker. We need to fight on. I mean, they are fighting on unfair, unscientific, yeah. ridiculous mm. kind of tactics. We have to point the tactics out and fight that battle first to be able to get back to a scientific debate where no one does name-calling, you'd hope, and uh, people could talk about the data and the observations, and but they, they don't want that, of course, because they lose those debates. They are desperately afraid of doing that kind of debate. Thanks for putting up that fight, Joe. because I'll say I've got to go, but I've got to say, because you were one of the first people, I came across your blog, it'll be over a decade ago, and I went, hey, look at this woman. She's going for it. She doesn't care. Wow. And that gave me real courage and real hope. So thank you for uh, coming thank on the David you. Richardson Show. You're listening to TNT Radio. Deweaponizing weather with reality and perspective. Any of you people fans of Steely Dan? I wasn't a real big fan of Steely Dan, but they had a song called Reeling in the Years, and there was a line in it that said, what passes for knowledge these days I can't understand. So they're doing this review down in Texas on the whole winter storm situation they had there a couple years ago, which, by the way, weatherbell.com called 10 days in advance. We had clients down there. They bought out all the generators five, six days in advance so that their employees were ready. But anyway, someone asked, from a climate perspective, how likely do you think we have another big outbreak like this? The short answer is it is likely, said one of the panelists, because of stratospheric warming being caused by climate change. Well, if it is being caused by climate change, that is a reaction. When the stratosphere warms, the troposphere cools underneath. So if the climate is changing back, there would naturally be more stratospheric warming. That's the first thing he doesn't know anything about. The second thing is, there's not more stratospheric warming going on. Stratospheric warming has been going on since we were taking balloon measurements. And at Weatherbell, we showed people, for instance, why in the United States, March and April would average out colder than January and February against the averages because of the big stratospheric warming event that went off in February. So this is the kind of stuff that is going on. Now, I could keep talking about this, but I went way, way, way beyond my minute. And I don't sound as good as Mark Morano, so that's it for now. This is TNT Climate and Weather Watchdog Meteorologist Joe Bastardi asking you to enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got.